Hello and welcome to the Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I'm Mark Stay. And a big thank you to our wonderful patrons and academics in the Bestseller Academy who sponsor this show and keep it running. And a big thank you to everyone listening to us today. Mr. D, how are you today, sir? I am doing brilliant. I'm loving the summer. I love the winter as well, but I also love the summer and it's just going by too fast for my liking. I really want to uh, to get outside a bit more <laughs> and take it all in. <laughs> but um, how about you? Has it been a good week in Blighty? Been very good week. Uh, my copy edits arrived yesterday uh, for the second, uh, which is a Woodville book, Babes in the Wood. And uh, I love, I love copy edits. I, there's a temptation if you're an author to be a bit dramatic and go, no, woe is me. Can you not see I'm being tortured by my copy edits? But for me, it's always the most fun part of the process because the whole thing finally gels into something that looks and reads remarkably like a book, like something <laughs> you'd actually give to people to read. And I got the word doc arrived from my copy editor, Lisa Rogers, yesterday, who, and she's brilliant. She's absolutely the best in the business. I just love her, love her to bits. And it arrived with over 3,100 changes oh, and comments. Just but- just 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> but most of them are... Um, uh, they're things like double spe- I use double speech marks and she switches to single speech marks which is I just like doing I've just got a habit of doing that and actually the house style for the publisher a lot of UK publishers just use single speech marks so there's there's a you know 1500 there uh, formatting ellipses page breaks little things like that so I just accepted all of them and then I'm left with over 300 comments most of those are small changes to avoid word repetition and stuff like that my big problem is I've got a time line issue every single bloody book a timeline issue but again i think that's a fairly straight i've I put a thing on the, the board over there my 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 story starts with um my character she's a bell ringer amongst other and a witch amongst other things but starts on a bell ringing day and ends with a village fair and i've just got to make sure every story beat in between of those makes some kind of sense um but yeah, it's uh it's nothing too taxi. I'm really looking forward to it. It's it's a wonderful wonderful it's lovely to get back into the book and those characters after such a break. And I've actually I've booked my copy editor Lisa Rogers to come on and do a deep dive next month. Uh we're going to go through the process from her point of view. Uh so folks if you're listening deep dives are for our patrons and academates in the academy. Uh we've also just done a just in a course on copy editing and proofreading for the Academy. So timing was uncanny. Well, I was going to say, what a great time to do a course for the Academy on this, which I've gone through and it's absolutely brilliant, by the way. But like, it's because you're actually right in the thick of it. So I was going to say, some people call it copy editing. Others call it masochism. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's fun. Seriously, it's fun. You've done it so many times. I've got to say, when you said 3000 plus, I also got a slight kind of little jump of serotonin when you said... Oh, and I got rid of one and a half thousand in one click. That must be yeah. that must be so much fun going from three thousand going except except this across the entire document. Whoosh. Bang! Yeah, oh, yeah, it, it, yeah. it suddenly lovely. goes from overwhelming to manageable. I, I felt yeah. like Thanos up there, you know, just click my finger and all gone. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was. Uh, it, yeah, it's good. I mean, and Lisa's great because she leaves you. Little, it's, it's always a conversation. It's never that. I think the fear is particularly if you're a first time author, you fear that a copy editor will go, "You're wrong. You are wrong. You have done this wrong. You know." nothing about punctuation and grammar and lisa is great and i think all copy editors like this in that there's a conversation they say okay uh maybe you want to try like this but actually if you're happy with this that's cool and they're just highlighting things to you and saying okay you might want to consider this and little things like the one character has a red mg midget and lisa just goes in about uh all the different kinds of mg midgets uh that were available in 1940 and actually she you know her granddad used to have one and she used to sit in the back and you know so it's just it just beca- it just brings it to life it's just you know what, wonderful Mark, I, i'm starting to think i'm starting to think between just between you and me i think editors are even more geeky than us oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's super geeky. imagine you get an editor who's into things like cars and stuff right then it's you've got game to, over you know, <laughs> yeah you've got to, they're great people to have on a quiz team because they have to be experts on everything yeah. you know or at least you have to know when you and you know i edit people's books as well you, you have to know when you see something i think that could be a problem that could be mm. sticky that could uh you might get 
you know, questions about that. So let's look into that. So, oh, actually, that phrase wasn't used until 1950. I've had that come up. You know, you've used language that you assume has been around for years and actually only came into the... Yellow rubber ducks, okay? I've got yellow rubber ducks in this uh, at, at a summer fair, and you kind of think, oh, yeah, yellow rubber ducks. They only became available to the public in 1940. So I'm so close to people going, well, actually, they didn't actually exist then, you know. <laughs> so things you assume have been around forever. Yeah. Uh, are, are, you know, you've got to... It's writing historical fiction, yeah. It's just one of the It is in some ways. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. My goodness me. I tell you what, though, this... um in in terms of kind of like learning that going through there's nothing like actually going through the process to learn it yourself but um i think the the course that you've done in the academy is brilliant because it really starts to break down i was i was very very confused when i first started this podcast having not gone through the process of editing about all the different kinds of editing things there are like different stuff and i think for it i mean i know there'll be like tons of people listening to this right now saying i don't know the difference between a you know copy edit and a and a, you know, I mean, there's there's a how many different editor types? And a line editor, editor, and yeah, yeah. There's right. all these it's, phrases going around, it's and so, so confusing. Yeah, we, we lay so, it out very clearly for people. Yeah. yeah. So if you're if yeah. you're interested in in learning more about um, the the kind of editing phase, if you're about to come to that stage, but actually, even if you're nowhere near it, I think it's essential to learn it and get get into it even before you start writing, because the more you understand about the process, the easier your novel will be for your editor. In fact, I remember very specifically Shannon Mayer telling me that the first thing that she did before she even got writing novels is she went on an editor's course, mm -hmm. not because she wanted to become an editor, but because she wanted to actually get into the mind of understanding of how very she's going to have to work. And if you do that, you, you will get a better edit because yeah, you, will you will be so much more prepared for it. So, so come and do the course in the Academy. It's academy.bestsellerexperiment.com. Um, and there's over 30 to 40 other courses currently there and growing. So yeah, yeah, amazing stuff. Now to this week's guest, Mark, we have, I've got to say one of my favorite interviews of recent time. It is a whirlwind tour of 22 mod minutes, but there's so <laughs> much in this. Tell us more about our amazing guest this week, Nicola May. Nicola May is a rom-com superstar, simple as that. She's the author of a dozen romantic comedies, all of which have appeared in the Kindle bestseller charts. Uh, two of them have won awards at the Festival of Romance. Uh, the Cocklebury Bay series has sold something like 800,000 books, give or take a few. Uh, the, the Corner Shop and Cocklebury Bay became the best-selling Kindle book in the UK across all genres in January 2019 and was Amazon's third best-selling novel that year. She's, she's been on the show before, actually. Uh, she, If you go back to episode 180, and I'll put a link in the show notes to that, we did a special episode from the London Book Fair. And that's that's actually a cracking episode because we speak to Emma Daktar, who's an editor at Orion, my agent, Ed Wilson, Natalie Fergie, a brilliant author, and we had five minutes with uh, Nicola May as well. Um, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. I've been trying to get Nicola to come back on the show ever since. And the timing is absolutely right now because she's got a brand new series, Ferry Lane Market. The, and she's moving from uh, traditional, uh, from indie rather, to working with a traditional publisher. So we talk about that moving from the autonomy of being indie to working with a traditional publisher. She answers listener questions on the essential elements of a rom com. She gives us tips on marketing on social media. And she has a lovely, lovely law of attraction story, which I know you, Mr. D, will make you come over all unnecessary. And she also reveals one of the best first lines of a novel ever. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, let's, Steve. So you're going you're gonna to strap in your seatbelts here, folks, because you are going to get very, very inspired listening to the amazing Nicola May chatting with Mark. Let's go. Nicola May, welcome to the bestseller experiment once again. How are you today? I am really well. The sun is shining and I'm very excited to be here. Oh, it's, it's an absolute delight because the last time we spoke... It, and it was in a previous episode, folks. And I'll put, I'll put a, a link in the show notes so you can go back and listen to it. But it was a London Book Fair episode where we spoke to a whole bunch of authors. And uh, I thought, I've always wanted to talk to Nicola May. And we got five minutes and it was your birthday and it was really noisy. And it was one of these things. And, and I thought, we've got to get Nicola back on the show. But when the timing is right, and the timing is absolutely right, because you have a new book out, don't you, Nicola? Tell us all about it. I do. And, and going back to that day, actually, it was amazing at the book fair because I was on the Amazon stand and my book 
Cockerbury Bay had got to number one. So we were all really cheering that on. So <laughs> yes, the new book, here it is. <laughs> Um, I put some little pins in there for your questions in a minute. But yeah, so we're at the Solo Market. It's out next Thursday. Um, paperback, ebook, audiobook. And also, amazingly, it's now in Tesco's and Sainsbury's, which is the first book I've managed to get in a supermarket. But wow. Obviously, this is with a traditional publisher now, so it's easier to do that. So yeah. Fantastic. So not only can you get the book, get extra club card points and nectar points or whatever it is as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Was that always an ambition, the, the supermarket thing? Yeah, I mean, I've given myself little steps all along the way for being an indie author from sort of even charting at all to getting in the top 10 to getting to number one was my massive dream. I only have to believe it. But yeah, so when I um, decided to go with the traditional publisher, which wasn't an easy decision, actually, it was to get on the supermarket shelves. And it's also now to get on the Sunday Times bestseller list. That is what I would love to do. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, if anyone can do it, Nicola, it will be you. Um, let's talk about that decision because... We've had lots of indie authors on here. That The thing they love is the autonomy. You know, they're answerable to no one except maybe their readers. They can publish yeah. when they want. They can publish in the formats that they can, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that is important to them. How do you feel working with Hodder on this book? Is it What are the big lessons learned? What are the big changes you've had to make? Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I went into it in, with trepidation, to be honest. I think the main thing was I, I'd worked with an editor very closely, my indie author editor, and I had to change editors. And I was like, oh, my God, what if they come back and there's loads of changes and I can't deal with it because I'm so used to dealing with someone and there hasn't been too many changes, luckily. But so that was my fear. But I ended, I had Thorne Ryan as an amazing editor and, and it seemed to gel. And he probably spotted things that I didn't. And so it's been really good on that front. And now Kim Atkins is my editor again, equally good. Um, yeah, lack of control. I every day still check my KDP dashboard for sales for Cockleberries. So yeah. obviously I won't be able to control and look at any of my figures. My only yardstick will be asking Hodder or seeing where I am in the chart next week. So mm. that's difficult. Um, on a positive, I wanted to keep hold of a say in my covers. So my wonderful 84-year-old father still actually illustrates my covers. So oh. that's great. Um <laughs> So, yeah, I think it is the lack of control and not being able to see my figures. But on a massive positive, the PR and marketing they've done around the book already and sort of the graphics and everything are excellent. So I'm really pleased. And the quality of the book itself, obviously, is amazing. Fantastic. Oh, well, I've got everything crossed. And folks will put links to Nicola's website in the show notes so you can find it nice and easy, nice and easy and grab a copy and help get her up the charts. That's what we all want. Um, I... I um I'd like to talk about how it all started for you because it is you have and Mr D will love this you have a wonderful law of attraction story don't you can you tell us about that? Do so I'll keep it quite brief. But Jim Carrey, the actor, he was jobbing with his father many years ago, and he decided to write himself a check for ten million dollars and put it in his wallet because he was like, "Gosh, I've got to, I've got to make it," kind of thing. Always wanted to. Anyway, um, he did make it. And so he, evidently the film he got the $10 million for whatever, he found this old check in his pocket and it came out all mothball And basically he achieved that dream by writing it down. So I thought, I'm going to do this. <laughs> so in 2011, when I self-published first, get it on the shelves, I thought, okay, I'm going to write myself a check. I like the number three. I find it one, two, three, ready, steady, go. It's such a positive number. So I dated it for the 3rd of the 3rd, 2019, eight years ahead because the nine devised into the three, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, in January 2019, um, the Corner Shop in Cockbury Bay, which is my ninth novel, got to number one on Amazon. And I didn't remember the check till I was organising my bookshelf because I put it in my very first book, working it out, and it fell out. And literally, and it was quite a good sum of money, to the actual pound, I'd made that amount of money that I'd written myself. No way. It makes me tingle now. And I've written myself another one. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, for the end of this year, so I'm like, come on. Um, but I really do believe, I've always believed, even when I was selling like 25 books a month or something like that, that I would get to number one on Amazon. It was my, I could see it. I visualise things. And that's why I kept writing. Because as I say, it wasn't until my ninth book that I actually got great success. I'd only ever had really moderate success until then. Wow. Mm. Wow. Wow. If you, if you put that in a book or a movie, you would be told to take that out because it was so unlikely. 
<laughs> so many people saying to me, oh, my God, I'm going to write my life story. And then I think, actually, some of the things that have happened in mine, I probably couldn't get away with it. But, um, yeah, it's and it is really believing. And it was like I won an award at the Festival of Romance and I sat in that theatre and I was like, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. I think it is believing in yourself. Right. Don't stop believing, as Journey, the band, once nobly said. Excellent. We've got, we've got some listener questions if you want to dive into those, Nicola, because, yeah. I mean, you know, lots of fans on the podcast, so they, they all want to know. Uh, Denise McGahn is one of our uh, members of our academy. She said, oh, great. She said, I'd love to know uh, what Nicola thinks are the vital components of a successful rom-com. What are the differentiators? Okay. Well, I kind of go into it as um, the plot of Cinderella. So you have your Prince Charming, you have your Cinderella. So they're your hero heroine. Your ugly sisters are your conflict. And then I also, for example, in working it out, there was an old neighbour. She was in her 80s and she was the fairy godmother. So I think if you look at it like that, and always it has to be the love story always has to come good at the end with a rom-com. But it's a really good way of looking at it. That's great because it's, it's something we've been to talking about on the Academy recently, actually, this idea that you can have... In a lot of TV shows, you have a five-man band. So you have the lead singer, the guitarist, who's like the cool anti-hero, the backing singer, who's the voice of reason. Or in sitcoms, you have a family of four. And I've got it there because I'm working on something. Matriarch, patriarch, craftsman, clown. And then you have, very often in groups of three, it's like the Hecate, um, maiden, mother, maiden mother crone. So with you, it's it's Cinderella. That's your kind of group, and you play with the status of those characters and, and how they interact. And also look what's worked before in great rom-coms as well. At the end of, say, Notting Hill, when, when the walk in the room kind of thing, there's just so many things that you can sort of take from things that have worked well. Fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant answer. I love that. Liz Green has a question, another academy, and she says, I'd love to hear if Nicola has any advice for non rom-com writers to add some light comedy to their work i'm writing a pretty intense political thriller but i know a benefit from a bit of levity in between the sabotage trees and murder does nicola have any favorite ways to add quick dollops of humor to a scene hmm. so that's quite a difficult question because i kind of tend, tend to write as i go along and find the humor but i did i think i picked this out actually so the first line in fairy lane market is my favorite first line in all my 14 novels and it's, I bet even the real Sid Vicious didn't shit in his bath water. So I do, <laughs> I do, I do, start, because I've always aimed, aimed to shock in my writing in a little way. I'm not fluffy little right because Sid Vicious has had terrapin. Um, I always bring, I always bring pets in for humour because the um, person can talk to pets in a way they might not talk to humans. And then another way is, I'm very carry on and innuendo, but there's another little bit here. So, Rachel is really rich, basically, in my book, and she's having it away with one of the market store boys. And just one of the lines is, well, our Rachel certainly does like a bit of rough. I know Darren's no stranger to her hunting lodge. She lives in the hunting lodge. So it's kind of just a bit of innuendo. But I just, I think it, unless I know what I'm, it'd be hard to actually say how you do it for thrillers. It's just sort of, just sort of throw a little bit in. I think, just, I think humour is part of life, though, isn't it? I yes, mean, we, we, we've we've all been to funerals where we've had a laugh. You know, we've yeah. been in serious meetings where we might be sitting sniggering at the back like naughty school children or whatever. So, I think it's some, um, you know, tonally, Liz, your 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 thing might be intense political thriller, but I guarantee that behind the doors of the White House or the Pentagon or wherever it's set, people will be making jokes at some point. So I think you just need to. I mean, the West Wing's a great example of that, isn't it? You know, it's where where there's you know throw in a bit of toilet humour. <laughs> <laughs> That's the title of this week's show, folks. <laughs> um, I hope that was helpful, Liz. Uh, Andrew Guile has a question. It says, "How did Nicola get her work noticed initially? Any tips for self promotion?" So you talked about that period where you were selling maybe a handful of books every week. Yeah. What obviously we I mean. It just occurred to me as well, 10 years, congratulations. You've been doing this for 10 years now. I oh, know. So, uh, of course, 10 years ago was a very different landscape uh, for mm -hmm. indie authors. But what are there any kind of evergreens that you think help would help authors today get started? I mean, when I started out, I was actually posting manuscripts. It was years ago when I started. And so now it is so much easier, really, with everything with indie. Um I class myself as a PR whore. Basically, I set up every social media account possible. And every single day for the last 10 years, I have posted something 
whether it be, hey, it's a lovely day and I'm going to write some sunlight, nothing hopefully too boring, but also something about one of my books. Um, and I've kind of, so it isn't too monotonous. I would link it in. So say my pinned tweet last week with the football, with the new book coming out, I put, it's coming soon, it's coming soon, three books on the shelf. And not everyone would have got that. But to me, I was like, that's genius. And obviously, Valentine's, you do things around love if you write romance. And it's it's just putting something out there because there's so much content out there from me that hopefully they say, I think it's someone has to see something eight times before it sinks in. I'm surprised more people don't know about me, really, because I'm always out there. But yeah, it's just being consistent and not thinking that you're pissing people off. And I say that, sorry. But um, even on Facebook, I used to think, oh, my God, I've put something up three times when a new book's out. But only one person might have seen that once. Don't be scared of doing it. I, I have to confess, uh, Nicola, I've seen your strategy and pinched it wholesale for myself. Because <laughs> I, I, saw, I, I think it, she's tweeting every day. She's on Instagram every day. There's stuff coming up. Uh, but what's different is it is you. It's your personality. It's not like a marketing tweet. It's not you know. It's you coming across. So I thought, I'm just going to do the same. You know. And it, and the thing is, it it doesn't happen overnight though, does it? it? You don't start tweeting seven days a week and then suddenly you're selling a million copies. Yeah, there's think, there's a lot of persistence think, involved, isn't there? Yeah, and I think that's where people fail. So like, and they see other authors doing well, and they probably see me doing well. Like, oh my god, but. I have worked for years tirelessly to get here. It, it's you have to be persistent, and I think people probably do give up because they're not getting what what they want. But I I would say just keep going. You've written a book. You're talented. You you the cream will rise to the top if you're good enough. It really is a long game, and this is this is something. Um, I mean, like I said, you've you've been at this. I mean, ten years, and we've well, got. I've, been at it longer. I've wrote my first books way back, like twenty three years ago. Yeah, yeah. And there is a misconception, I think, that you write one book and then you get an agent and then you get published and then it's all, you know, you know, uh, it's, it's peaches and cream from there on. But it does require a lot of tenacity, which I think you have in spades. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK, uh, we've got a question. For, well, a joint question from Angela Nurse and Rhoda Baxter. Uh, Angela started, said, I'm really interested in Nicola's indie author marketing strategy. And Rhoda says, seconded. Uh, Rhoda says, I know she worked hard on the hustle, so it would be interesting to see if she could elaborate on that a bit. So apart from the social media presence, what yeah. other marketing tips have worked for you? I think the, the thing that, I mean, there are a lot of blog tours about now, but Rachel's Random Reads started doing blog tours for me, which if people don't know is you sort of coordinate, say, 50 bloggers uh, and they read and review the book on their actual specific romance blogs. It's brilliant. I'm really rubbish at third party SEO, it's called, where, where you get everything moving around on the web. But once someone hashtags you, if you think if 50 people are reading and reviewing, that's a lot of movement that's going on and people seeing your posts. And I do think with the corner shop in Cockery Bay, the one that, book that went to number one, the blog tour that Rachel did really escalated me because it was magnificent and suddenly everything started rolling. Um, hustle wise though, I did, um, I went to the London book fair and a lot of authors don't go there unless they're a named author. And I walked on sort of Gardner's stand and Bertram stand, which are book distributors. And I made friends with the guys on there and said, I really want you to actually put me, stop me. And it was a case of being bold, speaking to people. Here's my book. I walked onto the KDP stand, the Amazon stand, and I'd missed the MD's talk at the time. And I said, can you give me 10 minutes of your time, please? I want to know how Amazon works. This is my book. I chased the guy who was the book buyer of WH Smith. I ran behind him and I said, Matthew, please can you take this? Love me Tinder got put on the shelves of Smith's Travel. And um, the one thing that I'm really proud of, which again set me off, I walked into Waterstones in Windsor with my very first book. And there was a lovely lady called Carol Dixon-Smith. I said, I'm an indie author. Could you give me a chance? She read it. The next day, she said, I loved it. Can you come and sign on Saturday in Waterstones in Windsor? And I was like, oh, my God. I rang all my friends. I rang my family. I said, you've got to be round the corner buying this book. So I sold 42 books. She said, amazing. And then she emailed all of the Southeast branches. And every week from then all summer, I was there. And I think not everyone has got the personality to do that or, the, or but I just think I, I've just I was never frightened of getting pushed back I think you have um, to be a bit of a squeaky wheel don't you you have to be there's a fine line between being pushy and obnoxious and actually okay. just having a 
as you said, self-belief, a little bit of self-belief that what this book that you've, you know, worked blood, sweat and tears on deserves a readership. And it, it takes a bit of nerve, doesn't it? It takes nerve. And I think also being kind and, and yeah. treating people as you'd have them treat you as well. And and not think, oh, I've written a book, I'm amazing. It's like, wow, I really would like your help, I think. Mm. And I think you'd be surprised how many people will help you on your mission. Mm. Mm. No, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Jeff White has a question. What advice would Nicola give herself when she was starting out? God. <laughs> it would be, I mean, I I, I signed a, a seven book deal with a publisher. I also, the main thing I think, I sold the rights away to my audio book of The Corner Shop in Cockery Bay to W, is it F or H House, who were a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And I think it was a, maybe at the start, it was like I took everything that was offered to me because I was worried I wouldn't get a second offer. And I think it is believing yourself and say you do get offered something, really check out who they are and don't just sign the first thing that's that's thrown at you. I don't regret going for the first audio book because I, I, it was the time I did it. But I think I've, I actually produce my own audio books now and it's such an easy process that I would advise people to do that because you do make more money. Mm, no, very good. Very good. We're obsessed with writing habits on this podcast and we love hearing the writing habits of our guests. So what sort of writer are you? Are you a write every day kind of writer? Yeah. Writing habits, Nicola May. I write in, well, I did write in bed for the first 13 books and I would write in the morning from say 6am, probably for six, seven, eight hours, depending how I could do it. But in literally my back, yeah. <laughs> Please write some bed. Look how successful she is. I found that no, I didn't get any distraction, and I, I just literally was there. But my back got so bad after all these years that I now have like a, a chair and I sit in my kitchen. But I do write early in the morning usually, and now weirdly five hours is sort of my attention span. But I'm in the middle of a book at the moment, and I really am deranged. And all I do is think about my characters, and I feel guilt the whole time I'm not writing. So I have to try and write something every day. Excellent stuff. And are you big on outlining or do you just jump right in? No. I literally let the story take me. Although since I've been with Hodder, they have liked to have a synopsis up front. And being honest, it has helped me because you do have that guideline of where you're going. But the characters change and a bit of plot changes, but it gives you a helpful thing to do that. Does it help having an established precinct location like Cocklebury Bray or Ferry Lane Market? Is Does that is that its own piece of the process, creating an environment for your characters to interact? Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, weirdly, the corner shop in Cockroach Bay was a standalone. Didn't even think I'd write three more books. It did so well. I was like, shit, I better write a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> and then the trilogy worked so well. I thought, oh, I better add a Christmas one on. So, yeah, I'm literally just so sporadic, but it seems to work. But, yes, yeah, so the first of a trilogy is really hard to write because you are developing that whole environment. And But I love it because... There's a there's a park that they go to. There's the cliffs they go to. There's the pub. It is, I guess, a bit like writing EastEnders. You've got all of those places to send people. So then you've got to realise how and why you're sending them there. So it, it is great, actually. But the first one is always like writing a standalone book. And then the second and the third tend to be, a, well, a little easier. <laughs> do you, you have do to remember obviously everything that's in all of them and all the characters and everything about them so do you keep a sort of database or anything like that or do you just rely on your own memory I find the synopsis i write i just add notes on the end so i do sort of date of births and ages when i start thinking oh my god she'd have been that age when and yeah okay are they yeah. based on places that exist does that make it easier or are they an invention yeah i mean Hartmouth is actually Dartmouth in my mind, even right. though Dartmouth's in Devon. So the ferry crossing and everything is really in my mind. Yeah. Mm, brilliant. Dittisham was totally fictitious. I kind of had Clavelli in Devon in my mind. It's such a beautiful little steep slope that goes down. So hmm. wonderful stuff. What's in the future? This is a big period of change for you because um Scott Pack, I know you work with Scott Pack, and when he basically re retired um, last year, he 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 didn't talk about his great achievements here or there. He mentioned you, um, you know, which I thought was wonderful, and how tirelessly you campaigned to get indie authors' sales recognised by the bookseller. Um, you know, you've done that, which is amazing. You, you've done this deal with Hodder, which is incredible. Big period of change. What's what's coming in the future for you, Nicola? 
and Scott was amazing because he channeled me from book one, as you say, yeah, and he's, he's such a lovely man. And plus, him as a friend now. And and also, I mentioning with the bookseller, I did champion to get ebook charts, which never existed. I was yeah. saying, look, music charts have the ebook charts and everything. So yeah, the bookseller did agree after me going on Radio Four. So I was really happy. And I love champion indies. And I always say, ask me any question. What is next for me now? Well, obviously, it's going to be a big push. I've got three books coming out. July, November, then next April. So it'll be amazing to see what happens. And then obviously, let's see, will Hodder, will I go with Hodder again? I don't know. Do you know what I kind of want to do? I want to write a screenplay. Ooh. That's what I'd like to do. Okay. Um, although I have got a little bit of interest now from an agent with regards to TV and film for Cock, well, for Cockerbury. Wow. It's all, as we know, and as you know, it's really hard, everything you have to wait and see what happens. But, yeah, you're right. I kind of – I'm not 100% sure at the moment. Okay. Well, it's going to be exciting, whatever it is. It really is. Yeah. And a screenplay, fantastic. Go for it. You know, conquer that world as well. Just be amazing. Yeah. Well, Nicola, it's been a joy having you on the show here to speak to you properly for once. And uh, best of luck with Ferry Lane Market. Uh, I think it's going to be an absolute smash. Uh, like I said, folks, we'll put links in the show notes so you can find the book nice and easy. Uh, where can folks find you online, Nicola? Okay, so nicolamay.com is my um, website. Um, at nicolamay1 is Twitter. Author underscore Nicola is Instagram. The books are being sold on Amazon, Waterstones, all, all over. Um, and I will add, if you do add me on social media and you have got a specific question, I, I answer everyone who contacts me. So please, please ask away. No questions too small. Brilliant. See, this is why we all love you, Nicola. This is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And let's not leave it so long next time. Uh, let's speak again real soon. Thank you so much. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. I honestly don't know where to start with this, Mark, to be honest. I mean, we usually just like jam around our, our uh, post, but in there's bed. so much. Well, let's in start in bed. bed. Absolutely. Yeah, well, let's do that because... <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, do you know, it was fascinating when Nicola said about that, because the first thing I remember thinking is someone once telling me, if you're, if you're feeling ill or you need just a bit of time to yourself, answer the door in your pajamas. And people were like, oh, oh, I'm really sorry. I didn't, is it, you know, and I think the idea of like lying in bed writing, like people just do, they do, in the, Winston Churchill did that. I think he did, did. like the first few hours of his work in bed in the morning and i think yeah. they're onto something winston yeah, and nicola but, yeah. <laughs> yeah well she mentioned uh, marianne keys also does this as well uh who's you know huge best-selling author and i think it takes that thing which we've talked about before which is you know make it your if you can make it the first thing you do there's the 5 a.m writers club you know people get up at five the mistake they make is they get out of bed just stay in yeah, bed. Stay in of course, bed. if you've if you've got someone in the bed next to you, they might not appreciate you firing up a laptop, boom, and the fan go, <laughs> you know, and, and all the that kind of stuff. Of the keys. Tap, yeah. tap, 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 and you going, oh bloody hell! Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's uh, if you can do that. That's um, like, like she says, it might not be great for your back. Uh, I have the I have those V shaped pillows. Oh, I have a V shaped pillow with. as well. Yeah, 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 yeah I have yeah, as well. Yeah. I must admit, I do. I do. I think my problem with that not problem it's actually because it's a guilty pleasure for me because on sunday mornings it's the only day that i might get a line if i'm lucky and i do like i start reading and then i'm like oh it's, i better get up and and i thought oh the kids are good they, they know how to make cereal um <laughs> i've trained them well and um, <laughs> dinner breakfast and lunch but um the thing is is that <laughs> I, I like i do love that i find i'm really creative when i'm when i'm in my room 
in the in the bedroom in in the morning. I, I do. I've been doing my two hundred words in in bed in my journal. Um, no handwritten. And mm-hmm. but I I kind of like by the time it gets anywhere near like. 9 30 10 11 i start thinking oh i'm such a slob <laughs> you get up because then you, you but you know i i do my best work so there's definitely something in it there's something it's like there's the, the there's the no pressure of being in that environment which is almost like a restful peaceful space which isn't necessarily like you know hard hard labor as it were out in the house or in the garden or whatever so i think uh the filmmaker i might be wrong about this but i think the filmmaker ben wheatley and his wife is his film editor I think they have all the editing equipment set up in their room. So they basically roll out of bed, edit, then eat, and then get back into bed. Uh, I think I think the more people do this than we realize, actually. So listeners, if you've if you are a bed writer, um, then let us know. Yeah. I think open the dam. I think a lot of people just don't talk about it. I think everyone's secretly like, oh yeah, this is totally me as well. I'm not the only one. That's brilliant though. I wonder, has anyone ever written, okay, here's a challenge to our listeners and academates and experiments. Has anyone ever written a book from start to finish in bed? We want to know of the book that was written from start to finish in bed. So if that was you, we'll give you a mention on the podcast. Um, as long as we don't get inundated with like a thousand people who've all done it. <laughs> so that's crazy. Now, another thing that I found fascinating, obviously, we're going to have to talk about this Um I when I heard the words law of attraction, I was like, Bing! No. <laughs> right? Because, you know, everyone knows me. I'm I'm a I'm I've lived I I've I, I live this kind of life. I, I've advocated about it on the podcast for years, about this idea of visualization. Um I have heard the story before, like she talked about the Jim Carrey story of writing the check. There's a lot of other examples of people and the fact that there's so many examples out there of this happening and Nicola being yet another um makes me wonder why everyone just doesn't do it. I mean, we all need a bookmark, right? We all need a bookmark. So make it a check of how much money you're going to earn from the uh, from the book that you're currently writing. Yeah, it's. I mean, ultimately, it's it's a way of setting goals, isn't it? You know, I I don't think it's that. It's not like universal ordering or whatever Noel Edmonds was going on about a few years ago. It's it's the fact of saying, okay, this is what I need to achieve. This is what I need if I'm going to do this. Um, and it's a promise to yourself as well. And there are people who can do that. There are people who are wary about that. Uh, but I mean, I I have my own goals. I have my own things that I want to achieve. Uh, you know, and then that gives you focus. That gives you something to aim for. And it doesn't have to be a Netflix series or whatever. You know, if it's something as simple as finishing a draft, getting getting a short story picked up by you know a website or a magazine or just something like that. Baby steps, baby steps. You know, so. Um, uh, but yeah, you you will know what you're capable of. But you know, we all have we all harbour secret dreams. Away. I mean, you tell me, Mister D, is is the secret not to make them secret? We've talked about public declarations and stuff like that. Well, it's the whole it's the whole science behind dream declarations, TM, which I'm going to put because that is something that we started on the podcast. It's something I was coaching about um, years ago. I kind of came up with this concept of the three Ds, and the the dream declaration idea is that. It's about declaring it. It's a. It's not a dream secret. It's about a de- declaration because, number one, it becomes more real when you say it out loud. It becomes doubly real if you say it to someone else. It becomes very real if you tell us to say it on the podcast. And for academates, we actually, one of the things you have to do in the academy is you have to make a dream declaration. Everyone does it. Everyone's vulnerable. It's a safe space to do it. You know, it's probably not as scary as doing it say, on the podcast to, to like millions of listeners. But the, the, the thing is, is that we have to say it out loud because when we say it out loud, it becomes real. And when something becomes real as a thought or, or you know, even as a something that you write, it becomes more likely, it, the science behind it is it's more likely to happen. It, you kind of like multiply the chance of it happening by like 10, 10 times. But the thing that's really interesting about the check specifically is it's actually, it's a dream declaration with something measurable. Like it's a number, it's, quanti- mm. it's quantifiable. You can say at the end of the day, did I achieve this? Yes or no, black or white. A lot of people who are just writing books dream of becoming a bestseller then they're not making specific goals about a date or a number, which then gives them a measurement. And again, when we talk about smart goals in the academy, we talk about, you know, measuring time-based, all these different elements that we go into in some depth. It's really important to know that 
that's the magic. It's the, it's the number, it's the date. It's something which holds you accountable as a writer because no one else will. Um, so that's, that's really, I think, for me, my experience of it and, and my own personal experience of it, that is how things have happened in my life because I put, I, I put parameters around it and it wasn't just a kind of like a, a, a kind of a, an amorphous mess of, of, a, of a kind of an idea. So I think that's really why, and that's why, you know, it happened for Nicola. I think it's, it's absolutely no coincidence. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? We could jam about this and we will, we'll be going more into detail you know, master classes and listening academy over time because it, I think I think this is the miss one of the missing kind of elements that a lot of people don't get any coaching or training on. You know, there's very few books on this. Um, there's yeah. some general stuff out there, but it's not for writers. You know, it's like the you know want to go and watch go watch the secret if you want to kind of go watch the secret DVD um, or Netflix. Uh, I think it's on Netflix. Um, if you if this is all new to you, um, but there's nothing out there for writers really in a big way. So yeah, that's something that I think we should do more of for sort for certain. Um, Mark, you also you kind of got quite excited about when she mentioned the Cinderella um, kind of groupings of characters because it's something again that you talked about recently. Is um, yeah, we had the we had the, my craft coaching session last week on the academy, and someone was asking about how many characters is too many characters. So we talked about those those kind of regular groupings. And that's not to say it should be formulaic, but it does help you give focus. So if you've got that five-man band, if you've got a four-person family, if you've got, you know, the the three witches or whatever, those kind of groupings can can really help you focus on what your character's purpose is in the story. And the Cinderella one I'd never heard before. I, I hadn't it's heard it. I was going to ask genius. you. Yeah. 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 I, I, and, and what's so great about it is it's so relevant to the, to the rom-com mm. or romance yeah. world world and i think yeah. to find actual examples of like classic stories that we all know so it's brilliant i mean because we all know the cinderella story and there's a reason those stories work you know there's a reason why we recognize those uh archetypes uh in you know because they do reflect family or hierarchies in society or whatever so you know if you can take something like that and apply it to your own story i'm not saying you know just use it as a formulaic thing but it helps i, I mean it's just what the hero's journey does is it takes sporadic mm. story elements and says actually if you analyze them this is what these different characters do but this the cinderella thing is 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 absolutely brilliant it just helps to give you a again like a framework around what you're doing mm -hmm. so that it's not so undefined and that's what i love yeah. about the hero's journey for all the kind of you know generic gener generalities that people talk about i love I, i'm one of these people that you give me give me boundaries and let me be super creative within the boundary i love that but if you yeah. put me in an infamous space i'm running around screaming going Aah! wear my trousers right it's like you know it's like <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> essential to have it's absolutely essential to have that kind of structure at least to start with and then you can you can kind of you know play with it as you go forward but um so yeah the other the other thing that i i think is very interesting and we've talked a bit more about this about and you've talked about this about not giving away your rights right up front you know don't sign hmm. the first offer you get um it sounds like it's a very common thing that a lot of um, first-time authors experience because they're just so excited. Not just not just first-time authors. I'm well, an experienced authors like me. I yeah. mean, I, I I am I am that that's kind of sign happy writer. You know, if uh, and we had this when we were doing auditions for the film because I get sent audition tapes and having been an actor you look at these audition tapes and I, I just want to go hire everyone. You know, <laughs> yeah, they're also brilliant. But yeah, it's but uh, yeah, you you um it is in important to especially if you're getting uh, attention from agents and publishers you know don't just jump on board with the first offer you get it is you do have to uh develop uh a thick skin yes allow yourself to get excited but then let that business brain click in and make sure you're because this is your future and you wouldn't get married you wouldn't marry the first person you you meet you know you you take you take a few things into consideration yeah first, for you know. at least a second coffee date right exactly exactly yeah. <laughs> um you go for a curry or something yeah but yeah yeah uh, something more people, in, in a white shirt <laughs> yeah these <laughs> well, actually i think i think i think the actually the better analogy <laughs> is curry, if you think of it. your books as 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 children if you think of the books as your children you're not just going to send them to any old school 
You know, you want to make sure the school is right for your kids or, or if you're because they, the publisher is going to be looking after those books for five to 10 years, maybe, you know, you might get this is what people don't understand is you're not selling your book to a publisher, you're licensing the book to a publisher. Uh, and they get to look after it for a few years and they can do things with it that maybe you can't. And are they going to do the right thing with your book? Are they the right match? And then when you get your book back, what condition is it going to be in? Have they done a good job or have they, you know, not, um, or have they, have they not done, uh, you know, not done it justice? And it, it's interesting that. Uh, Nicola, who has is used to this autonomy, when I asked her about a future with Hodder, she still kind of will wait and see. I love you know? that. I think, yeah, that's a yeah, sign of someone absolutely. that's been through the process and is now yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe wearing the battle scars from it, but also very, very savvy. And I love that. Yeah. And that's what we gain as experience, uh, you know, through the process. We gain, we gain the the wisdom, if you like, of of things we've done previously, but. I love it. And also, do you know what it says to me? It says to me how powerful Nicholas' like, confidence has grown through the journey. Um, it, 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 if you stand in your own light and you're like, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to weigh up my options in the future, that is a confident, successful author. But that won't have happened overnight. That was through her journey, but absolutely inspiring. And um, the, yeah, the, we the, could- the, the, the lesson to learn. Okay, and this applies both to screen, probably more to screenwriting, but just as much to publishing, is you have all the power, all the power until you sign that contract. Yeah. And then you and, have yeah. <laughs> I th- and then I think you write your pu- next book. <laughs> pu- publishers are a bit more malleable because you can have yeah. a conversation with them, but uh, filmmakers and TV companies, they have the rights. It's then theirs. So yeah. you really do have to be sure. I, I also think it, the world is changing. I think the world is changing. I think we're seeing in music, again, I always reference this, but mm. the world is changing. People, the musicians are getting a lot more rights moving forward. There are new companies that are developing new kind of publishing models, which mm. recognize um, the, the value of what the, the, the writer does in the process and doesn't like try and take everything away. And it's much more of a kind of a much more of a partnership than a kind of like you're working on our behalf now, um, which mm. sometimes can feel like, I guess, when you're signing, signing away like a, you know, a contract for, for many years. But we could jam around this for many more hours, and we will in the Academy. If you like, if you like listening to us ramble on, I mean, I, I don't quite understand it, Mark, but some people do. So if you like listening to us talking about this kind of, uh, these kind of areas, um, they inspire you. We go a lot, lot deeper in the Academy with our courses and our coaching. So uh, join us. We have a new opening happening at the beginning of September, beginning of a new academic year for many people. So if you want the next 12 months plus um, of your life to have a constant weekly thread of focus, support, coaching, courses, inspiration and and people cheering you on um then join us at the academy we would love to have you come and apply today at academy.bestsellerexperiment.com now mr stay we have some we have this week's wins don't we yeah we've got so uh so we've got uh from the academy so matt on the academy he's just had a children's short story sparks which was chosen as a winner in a contest uh which is great uh we've had mark hood who's a name we've heard on here a number of times, still got that incredible writing streak. But he's, again, getting short stories where in the past he submitted without success, but they're reach- they're now reaching out to him and saying, Mark, Mark, send us your stories. So this is this is the kind of community we got on the Academy as well. Uh, Marianne Barsotti, uh, she's just finished the first draft of her, of her current project. She says, it's very ugly. I struggle with my internal editor the whole time. I'm one of those writers who constantly go back and edit, which makes finishing take twice as long, but I'm working on that issue. Let's sit on this for a while uh, while I edit the one I've had marinating. But, you know, we've all been there, Marianne. And again, you just look at the comments and everyone's just piling in, uh, giving her support. So it's, um, yeah, it's all, all good news. People are winning over brilliant. on the Academy. All good, good, good. Yeah. And and even more more great wins on the Academy um, last couple of weeks, we had Edward Beresford, who finished his his fourth edit congratulations edward that is an incredible achievement people always say how many edits do i have to do well ed's on his fourth right now um and making incredible progress um new academy kim welcome kim she uh, declared her dream to finish her first draft by september this year and she is rocking into it already so go for it kim and Carl, Carl sign decided to take the plunge and courageously start again and i salute you carl because that 
that is that classic question that so many people go through. They, they, they work and work and work and they think, you know what, I'm just going to start from scratch, but he's not starting from scratch. He's, he's starting from the beginning again, but he's taking all of the good stuff that he's got, but yeah. with new clarity and he's going to race. We just know Carl, that you're going to race through that draft and you'll be coming out all the stronger for it. So congratulations to all our academates who are absolutely inspiring us every single week with the progress that you're making incredible progress and uh, mr stay if people want to find us on social media and tell us about their wins where's the best place come and find us at uh facebook we're bestseller experiment twitter and instagram we are at bestseller xp if you want to drop us a line we're bestsellerexperiment.com and you'll find a contact tab there to send us an email if you've enjoyed this please subscribe rate review on your podcast catcher if you leave a little rating that helps make us more visible which really really helps us reach out to more authors and get their voices heard and a big thank you as always to our editors dave and jd and in case you haven't heard we have a book out called back to reality it's a bestseller oh, yeah. on amazon <laughs> we haven't mentioned that in a while have we um, yeah. i just forget there's people listening to this show for the first time if you may just jumped in then please please check out our book uh, we really appreciate everyone who's left uh, over 155 star reviews now i don't even haven't kept up with it lots and lots so we really we're really grateful for that and i'm actually really inspired because our book is it's not it's not rom-com but it's it's definitely com and com. yeah there's lots of fun stuff in there so if you like a laugh this summer uh if that's the uh you know side of the uh equinox that you live um you know grab it <laughs> go go to your campsite read back to reality if you fancy a bit of uh, a bit of fun and but with a bit of depth as well i'd say mark it's not it's there's you know it's it's comedy but it's also there's you'll a few, laugh you'll cry, you'll cry you'll never look at a cow in the same way again let's just <laughs> exactly. say that exactly and um also not to forget folks if you are struggling with your writing aren't we all day to day come and try our free 200 word challenge go to 200 wordchallengecom try it for seven days can you write 200 words a day that is a challenge it's harder than you think give it a go and then if you love it stick with it and by the end of the year you will have a book and then you'll be telling it about us on the podcast so so mr say thank you so much again what a great great uh, interview thank you nicole for nicola for giving us all of your wisdom and advice and it's a goodbye from mark one and goodbye from mark two ta <laughs> goodbye <laughs>